the volatility doesn't help. Talk about that. I mean, moving into this future environment where you've got these massive price spikes and then price dumps. You know, we work with a lot of private guys in the EMP space or the prime, you know, majority of our clients at our company. And they don't like it because it's like a lot of them want to exit at some point. You know, they're building up an inventory or they're building up a cash flow base. You know, it's typically been private equity. We do work with, you know, some kind of mid size and smaller, just private backed groups. Maybe their time horizon is different than maybe their family money or, you know, some kind of high net worth uh, fund or group of people and they have a longer term view. But a lot of these guys, it's transactional. They want to, you know, build something up and then flip it or sell it. And this volatility on the private side kills, you know, m and It's like you put a bid in and then gas prices drop 50% and it's like, well, or oil prices whipsaw, it makes that bid hard to close on a PSA. And then on the public side, I don't think it helps either, but moving into this like hyper volatile potential future, just the ramifications of that and uh, the headwinds that could push onto yeah, the it's, industry. It's, a, it's all great questions. And I actually agree with a lot of how you laid that out in terms of the challenges, both public and private. And look, Volatility usually is inversely correlated with valuation, certainly with with uh, publicly traded companies. And in terms of bid ask spreads and getting M and A done, mm. I think your points are well taken. That usually in a highly volatile environment, it's hard to agree to price. I'd say a couple things. I think companies, both public and private, are simply going to have to get used to and think about how they take advantage of the volatility. I think that's number one. I think number two, we cannot take for granted that insurance markets are going to be there and maybe not capital markets either over the long run. When you look at things like the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, I think this is, I, I actually think it's one of the most troubling organizations out there in that the net effect, despite a whole bunch of flowery language about caring about this and caring about that, is to essentially encourage companies to not support new oil and gas development. So you've already seen in Europe, Munich Re, you've seen HSBC and other companies say they're not gonna finance new oil and gas fields. And I think, you can say that's Europe. Uh, you can say it's two companies. The risk is that continues to grow. And there are lessons, therefore, to take away from the coal sector, which basically has very limited, if any, capital markets access and very limited, if any, insurance access. And I think you have to say it's an oil and gas company. Is this sector headed in that direction? I've been of the view that no, it won't, because common sense at some point is going to prevail and profits are going to prevail and some combination of the two will keep this sector in its good graces. But I, I'm starting to doubt whether I'm right about that. You know, and so say for all companies, how do you rid yourself of obligations? You, there's no such thing as too strong of a balance sheet. Because let's say you are in an extremely volatile environment. Do you have the cash to do an all cash deal if that's what's going to take a trough? Perhaps someone gets in trouble and you can take advantage of it. I think, how do you ensure, especially if you're at the smaller end of the spectrum, that if you do need to get insurance for bank finance or other, that you have a robust offering that will continue to be there? How do you continue to diversify who your capital market insurance providers are? But at the end of the day, you're gonna have to make friends with volatility. It, it, it's not about sort of cursing it. I think it's going to be here so long as capital uh, spending remains subdued. And so long as we continue to try and have some sort of economic growth, which hopefully we do. And so the volatility is gonna be here. And I think companies are gonna have to get used to it. And they're gonna have to be ready to pounce if it's on the acquisition side, when opportunities become available, but you don't know when they do. And you also don't know when your access to capital is not going to be there. So there's, again, no such thing as too strong of a balance sheet. How can companies either self-insure or figure out industry options for insurance? I think these are all the kind of things that are gonna be very important for both companies and industry going forward. And there's a role for larger companies to play because it's gonna be easy for larger companies to say, you know what, we're gonna be fine. We'll still have access to this and that. And I, I just say, I'm, I don't know if that's going to be true over 10 years. I can't guarantee that the ideology is actually going to change. I can't change the fact that if people continue to think we're going to have peak demand, no matter how wrong that continues to be year in, year out, that the capital markets somehow come back. Uh, you know, and so there might be a split between Europe, hopefully not the United States, but let's just say Europe and rest of the world. And is there capital in the rest of the world? the company should figure out a way to, to access. And maybe that's Middle East, maybe that's Far East, but I think people are gonna start thinking differently and not take for granted that the way they've traditionally done business is going to work in this kind of currently insane, and I don't know when it's gonna end. 